Hi hey everybody. So in this session we're going to be looking at the League of Nations in the 1920s. We're going to be looking at um, the opportunity that it had to solve some international disputes, whether it was capable of doing that, um, and then we're going to just discuss what that meant for the League and where that kind of left the power for the League. So to start with, um, I just want to go back and remind ourselves of um, what the aims of the League were, because in order to evaluate, as we're going to do, whether the League was successful or not in the 1920s, we need to remember what they were actually trying to achieve. So their four, sorry, five main aims were to prevent aggression to any nation. So they shouldn't have favorites. They shouldn't think, well, you know, this um, nation is going to benefit us individually as countries. Remember, they're working together as a body. So they should focus on making sure that every single nation is protected. They want to encourage cooperation between nations. So for what nations to work together, they want to work towards international disarmament. So countries um, not having any weapons. They want to improve working and living conditions of all peoples. That one we, co we covered in the last video on the League's agencies. And then they're going to uphold the Treaty of Versailles. So the restrictions that have been placed upon Germany and the punishment that Germany faced in the First World War. So in the 1920s then, were they able to do that? So we're going to look at um, the different disputes that happened in the 1920s. And we're gonna start with Vilna in 1920. And we're gonna talk through all of these and then we're gonna decide whether they were a success or they were a failure based on what we know the aims of the League to be. Okay, so first of all, Vilna, 1920. So the League's new here. So it, it starts with really quickly an opportunity to prove what it can do and um, to sort of give countries and its members confidence in it to hopefully increase its membership and so on. So after the First World War, the countries that had been in Austria-Hungary's empire, so if you remember, Austria-Hungary was um, at the very start of the First World War when they, uh, when they had a conflict with Serbia over the killing of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Their empire were broken up and given independence, so lots of new countries were created, including Poland and Lithuania, which obviously are still countries today. Vilna was to be the capital of Lithuania, but mo the majority of people living there wanted to be Polish. Okay, so imagine you've got to think about when you think, well, why would they care if they spoke Polish, if they um, had lived and considered themselves to be part of this nation and they had a strong nationality that uh, fit with the Polish nationality rather than the, the Lithu Lithu Lithuanian one then they would have had this sense of nationalism that would have fit better with Poland. So the majority of people living there wanted to be Polish. A Polish army took control of the city and Lithuania asked the League for help. So remember, they're encouraging international cooperation, they're stopping wars. So if you are a member of the League of Nations, you if you have a dispute with another country, the idea is that you go to the League of Nations and they can offer you arbitration. So they can say, right, look, you've obviously got a problem. Let's sit down, let's talk about it and we'll come to a conclusion together. They didn't do that. They send an army in straight away. So um, Lithuania are like, hang on, this isn't how we do things anymore. So they asked the League to come and help them. So this is a really good opportunity for the League to um, use its arbitration power. However, now that we're gonna keep coming back to this because as I said before, one of the main problems with the League of Nations is that the countries that are running it don't necessarily believe in it and they have more of an interest in themselves and what they can gain um, rather than the success of the League as a body. So here's a really good prime example. So France saw Poland as a potential ally against Germany. So obviously this is a positive for France, right? They don't want to offend Poland because they want to have Poland on their side in case Germany were to attack again. Um, so they refuse to help. Um, Britain would not send troops without the support of other countries. So again, here we've got the problem, as we've said quite a few times already, of the League not having its own military. 
So it's lying on these countries, sending their own armies, and they won't do it. So for the first, the first time the League was asked to settle a dispute, they did absolutely nothing, and Poland took Vilna, right? So that's straight out of the bag there already. We've got a massive failure for the League. It's first time it's presented with an opportunity to solve a problem. It doesn't. So we're not off to a good start in the 1920s. Okay, let's then move on to... Um, from 1921 to 1925, we've got Upper Silesia. Now, we've got here an area of land which is on the border between Germany and Poland. Remember Poland being a newly created nation at this time. Um, both Germans and Poles are living there and both nations wanted to claim the area. Now, remember the um, terms of the Treaty of Versailles took away 10% of Germany's land. So it's not likely that the countries in the League are going to be awarding land to Germany, especially land that's going to give it um, any industry, any opportunity to raise money. So it was important to iron and steel production um, in both areas. So they have a plebiscite, which is um, basically a common people vote. It means everybody votes on a, on a, a, top, a subject. So it was organized to decide who would own Upper Silesia. So Britain and France sent troops to police voting stations to make sure the vote was fair and calm. So basically to make sure that neither nation sent troops and were like, you vote for this, okay? Germany won 60% of the votes, but Poland claimed that many of the people who voted for Germany no longer lived in Upper Silesia. They complained to the League of Nations, and sorry, they complained and the League of Nations decided to split Upper Silesia into regions according to how the people had voted. So Germany received most of the rural areas, while Poland received the industrial zone. So that's positive for Poland, because if you've got the industrial zone, you've got the money making potential. So the outcome, now this is important, this is where we can see how this is a success. The outcome was accepted by both Germany and Poland and the League made sure that the partition went smoothly by ensuring that rail links, water and electricity were still supplied to each side. However, the final settlement was considered unfair. By the Poles, they received roughly half of the population but only a third of the land. So obviously that means that the people who live there now, they're struggling for places to live, they're struggling for enough resources, enough land to be able to feed them, et cetera. So around half a million Poles were now in confirmed German territory. So we've got a similar problem we had in Vilna. The people who were made to live in Lithuania didn't feel Lithuanian, they didn't want to be Lithuanian, same here. So the people who um, consider themselves to be part of Poland are now classed as German citizens. And we get that problem quite a lot. We'll come back to that as well when we look at the SAR a bit later on. So they lost, um, Germany's weren't satisfied because they lost three quarters of the coal mine they had owned prior to the, the settlement. And obviously Germany here is struggling for money and, and because of the, oh, move on there. Get rid of that, um, because of the reparations, they are struggling for money. Um, a valuable source of income for them that they now don't have access to. So in 1922, the government complained to the League and was awarded the right to import coal at a heavily discounted rate. Um, when this agreement ended, relations between Germany and Poland worsened. Now, this one is probably the trickiest one. It's not very clear cut this on whether it's a success or a failure. You can probably judge it as both. So if we look at the top here, we've got the fact that the settlement was accepted, you've got that as a success. And obviously they have avoided war, but the fact that they haven't really encouraged international cooperation here um, because these countries don't have a positive relationship. So we can argue that that part of it was a failure. What historians argue about this particular dispute in the 1930s is basically that the League did their best. Okay, and it was kind of like, well, in this situation, no matter what you did, neither side was going to be happy with it. So they did do the best that they could, but it wasn't a complete success in Upper Silesia. So then we've got in 1921 again, the Allen Islands, Island Islands, sorry. So both Sweden and Finland claimed these islands 
uh, and they were between the two countries and they were threatening war on each other, exactly what the League doesn't want. The League investigated each country's claims. They decided that the island should go to Finland. However, Finland was not to, uh, allowed to build forts on the island so they could not be used as a base from which to attack Sweden. Sweden agreed and the League had successfully avoided war. So this one, pretty straightforward, resounding success um, based on the aims of the League. Then we've got Corfu. So we've got, um, oh, sorry, I don't know this one. Going any smaller, that's okay. This one, okay. Leave it at that size. So after the war, um, boundaries of Greece and Albania were still to be agreed upon. The League gave the job to an Italian um, general, but while he was surveying the area of Greece, he got killed. Mussolini wasn't happy about this and he blamed the Greek government. So he did, demanded that the murderer should be executed and he should be paid compensation. Um, but the Greeks didn't know. So Mussolini invades and occupies Corfu, which is in Greece, and he kills 15 people. They appeal to the League because obviously this is an aggressive act. This isn't maintaining um, peace. Uh, bearing in mind that Italy is one of the main uh, on the Council of the League of Nations, a permanent member of the Council of the League of Nations. So they shouldn't be using violence. They should be going directly to the League of Nations. So again, we're seeing that undermining it, that non-belief in the League, even from its leading members. Um, they agreed that Greece should pay the compensation and they wanted to award that to Italy once the killers had been found. Mussolini wasn't satisfied and he complained to the Conference of Ambassadors, a powerful group of countries, outside of the League, including the other three members of the Council, Britain, France and Japan, and he persuaded them to undermine the League. So again, all of the members of the League now are going around it and not using it. All of the leaders, sorry, not all of the members. Greece was made to apologise and give compensation. He did withdraw his troops from Corfu. Um, the League, however, he approved that they could be ignored and overturned by other international groups that they were also a part of. So this one is a, a failure in what the League um, does for its own reputation, but it's a success in that it does, um, I'm oh, sorry, no, not a success for the League, it's a success for the other country, for the, for the other organisation, sorry. 1925 in Bulgaria, Greece again, so Greek soldiers were killed on the Bulgarian border, Greece invades, which obviously they aren't allowed to do. Bulgaria appeals to the League for help, the League condemned the Greeks and ordered them to withdraw troops and pay compensation. However, they were being hypocritical here because they, they let Mussolini get away with it in 1923. But the only reason that this is a success for the League is, as I mentioned before, the punishments on countries are going to be more um, taken more seriously in smaller countries because they don't have that clout behind them to back them up. So because Greece is a small country, it's unwilling to risk poor relations with powerful members of the League, such as Britain and France, and so they obey. So this one is a success based on only the fact that Greece couldn't afford to pick a fight with Britain and France. And then finally, we have the Wall Street crash in 1929. Now I'm going to talk about a bit more about this um, in a few videos time when we talk about the impact of the depression on the League and relations in the 1930s. So in 1929, the American economy crashed and the country was plunged into a devastating depression. It lasted all the way through the 1930s and America traded with countries around the world and had lent a lot of money during and after the war. So global economies are affected here not just the American economy. The whole world faced economic depression and people lost faith in their governments, as we'll talk about, especially in Germany. Some people turned to extremist parties such as the Nazis in Germany who promised to make Germany strong again by overturning the Treaty of Versailles. Now, remember, one of our main aims of the League was to uphold the Treaty of Versailles. So if you've now got people working directly against that aim, so your aim is to uphold it, their aim is to destroy it. If the League is not powerful, it's not going to be able to fight um, Germany on that. And it's not, obviously, because we've seen that it's not been successful. So far in the 1920s, 
And in order for it to be successful, its leading members need to stick together and work together. And we've just seen how many times they've undermined the league. So the league is powerful, sorry, powerless to do anything to help people or to control these new party leaders who are willing to resort to violence to get their own way. And that's really, really important. OK, so that's the 1920s. We've got some success and some failure. Um, I'm going to do an exam technique um session on a, a balanced argument one and i might come back to the 1920s to do that because this is a really nice one where you get a statement and you've got to either agree or disagree um but for now i hope that's been a, a good overview for you of the 1920s thank you for tuning into this video and i hope to see you in the next one